YouTube allows swearing after the first seven seconds of the video now, so I'm just gonna be straight up. This game is bullshit. This is the most painful, weird video game experience I've ever had, summarized perfectly in one word. I've been playing it for... Five days? Bro, it feels like I could have like made something of my life. It could have gone to college and got a degree with the time that I spent playing this bullshit. I can't even use the word play comfortably to describe what I was doing with this game. Cause you know, play usually means fun, right? The game certainly was playing me though, like one huge, thick and throbbing fiddle. I do not know what a fiddle is. And I kind of liked it. So obviously Fear and Hunger is not your regular game. It's not even really as bad as I lied it was in the intro to capture your attention. But it is weird. I came across it on YouTube and it looked like a thing that I'd click away from in a second just for being brown. You know we here at Chrome Rat Franchise Incorporated don't appreciate shit unless it's like pastel pink and blue. Yeah. But something about it made me keep watching. For one, it's Berserk inspired and Berserk is like my second favorite thing in life. Also, I could immediately tell it was some lone dev's attempt at projecting the darker areas of his imagination in a way that's unique to him. You don't really get that with bigger teams. Sometimes the appeal of the game is the mental illness of the person who made it and you can't really get multiple people on the same page in that regard. I honestly haven't even checked if this is a solo project, but it's a psychological horror dungeon crawler made an RPG maker, so the dev has never felt the touch of another human being. You know who else has never felt the touch of a human being? You, because you sit on your computer all day visiting suspicious websites like virus.com, and you don't even use today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. Pathetic. Atlas VPN is the simplest and most affordable piece of software you'll ever use to get that extra peace of mind when browsing the internet. It takes you literally two clicks to connect to a server and enjoy all the benefits of browsing the internet privately. You're putting an extra layer of protection between your passwords, IP, or other sensitive data, and whoever is trying to access it on the other side. Atlas VPN does this by using some nerd magic to trick the websites you visit into thinking you're in another country, which by itself comes with its own perks. You can unlock location gated content anywhere online which is especially useful for streaming sites like Netflix that have different catalogs in different countries. Atlas VPN is one of the rare providers that support unlimited devices on a single subscription so if everyone in your family gets 10 phones for some reason you will all be able to protect your browsing data. On top of this Atlas also blocks malicious links, ads and trackers and notifies you when someone is trying to steal your data all for just $1.80 per month if you use the link below. Go to get.atlasvpn.com slash nocapgaming to get a three year deal plus three months free for just $1.83 per month with a 30 day money back guarantee. Back to the video. Like every other game I've ever talked about on the channel, what drew me in was the vibe. And like every other game I've ever talked about on the channel, I have zero clue what this story is about. You know what, we haven't talked in a while, you and me, and I upload so often that I actually change as a person between uploads. I'm getting tired of the YouTube video essay meta of explaining the obvious for 40 minutes straight, so let me assume you're reasonably intelligent, maybe even a cut above the others, and skip talking about all the parts of the game that you can already guess by taking a single glance at it, so we can jump right into what makes it different. I also want to keep this video short, because I played for like six hours today and I'm still in yesterday's save with zero progress made so I refuse to expose myself to the agony any further. You walk into a room and step over a wooden plank with a rusty nail. Haha <laughs> you're bleeding now and unless you bandage up you'll slowly bleed to death. Should have paid attention to your surroundings oh loser. God. You decide to jump down a big gaping hole just because it was given to you as an option. <laughs> Both of your legs are now broken and you can only crawl at a snail space for the rest of the game. Shouldn't have been a dumbass, dumbass. You try to sleep to save the game, but you lose a coin flip, so instead you get obliterated by a high-level enemy. Shouldn't have... lost the coin flip? 
you're just walking, minding your own goddamn business when a hole opens up below you and you lose a coin flip again so you fall down and break your legs. Huh? Yeah, the game is unfair. It's not even unfair in a frustrating way where you at least feel entitled to go on Reddit to complain about it. It makes you pick between blue and pineapple, kills you in the most bizarre way imaginable for making the wrong choice, and then laughs at you and calls you a pussy. I know I'm not gonna be able to capture all the exact same sequences again when I go to record footage for this video, cause I don't even know how I triggered half of this shit, and it feels like there's an infinite number of these odd little... Let's call them quirks instead of the developer's sadistic fantasies. Yet surprisingly, this is not a rage-inducing game for me. Most of the time, I just sit for a few seconds blankly staring at the menu screen, processing how my character was just skinned alive, had his limbs cut off and thrown into a pit full of bodies where I could still make him crawl for a few seconds before he succumbed to his injuries. So remember how I said the game is super unfair? It's actually not as unfair as it first seems. Jumping into the game for the first time, it feels like like it has a personal grudge against you specifically, but as you keep playing you kind of learn to read it so to speak. For example, if you really want to jump down some bloody cursed hole for whatever reason and you happen to have picked up a stone earlier, you can use this stone instead of your own body to check the depth. If you try to pull this suspicious sword out of some rubble and your character specifically states that the walls seem unstable, what do you think happens? You get rewarded for your bravery with a super OP sword? Fuck no! The the walls collapse, killing your entire squad but leaving you alive to observe the consequences of your actions. You're trapped and unable to move, but you can think about what you did for a few seconds before the menu screen pops up. Now, granted, you don't always get safety measures or warnings. Part of the experience is dying. A lot. If you're close to where you saved, you're usually a lot more daring in your exploration because you can just restart from the checkpoint with the newly acquired knowledge of what happens if you try to join the naked furry orgy and lose a coin flip. Saving is one of the few truly unfair mechanics. There's only one guaranteed save in the beginning and one permanently safe bed towards the end game after you beat a boss to unlock it of course. You thought you were getting it for free? <laughs> There is also a rare perishable book you can use for a guaranteed save, and considering I was lucky enough to find it a couple times, it helped a lot in my playthrough. You can also use an extra coin in any coin flip situation, including saving, to double your chances, although I somehow always forget about this and have never used it once so far, so you could make the argument that saving being one of the few truly unfair mechanics kinda maybe plays into the experience somehow and keeps you on your toes, but you'd have to win the mental gymnastics olympics to try to justify the infection status effect. Remember how the rusty nail gets you bleeding? Well it can also infect you, and so can a bite or scratch from any of the numerous disgusting disease carrying enemies. <laughs> I counted 22 status effects on the wiki, and infection is by far the most annoying. And one of the others is severe bleeding. Oh, by the way, you're gonna wanna make friends with the wiki as soon as possible because this game does not respect you enough to bother explaining shit. Like, alright, I'm pretty sure I know what this means. But what the fuck is this? Oh, it's a tapeworm. Of course. I could have just noticed that my character's hunger is building twice as fast. Oh, I don't know. 20 hours into the game and tried every random item in my inventory to fix it, I could have just guessed what any of the numerous accessories do, since most of them just say something like, grants the wearer an overwhelming affinity to e-girl feet, without giving any clues as to the practical meaning of that. But I'm just, I'll look it up, it's fine. This is a surprisingly deep game, so you're gonna wanna google a lot of random questions like you would for a game like Elden Ring, for example. Uh, the difference is that fear and hunger doesn't really have that big of a community, so it's likely that the wiki will be the only place you'll be able to skim some insight from. I was talking about infection, right? Once your arm or leg is infected, it's basically guaranteed sudden death somewhere down the line. There are two problems with this. The only safe cure is a green herb, and there's like three of those total, at least in my playthrough. And also, Everything gets you infected. A scratch from some measly fucking bat that deals 7 damage has now derailed your whole run if you're out of green herbs. Guess the other way to cure an infected limb. Bone saw. And it doesn't just happen instantly. Oh no buddy, you have to sit there and listen to the, and I don't say this lightly, 
excruciating sound of it happening. This is like the exact opposite of ASMR. Instead of tingles on the back of your neck, you get shriveled up retracted balls. You can live without one arm and one leg, but considering how other attacks and way more important encounters can also take off a limb, it's truly a last resort measure. It does give you a cool paw talisman if you can bear the guilt of using it on the wolf though. Now, combat and even these random status effects become way more manageable with more members in your squad. The combat in this game is... Let's just say there is a lot of dicks to cut off. Each body part is separately targetable, so if someone is holding a weapon, chopping off that limb will disable the weapon attack. Taking off both legs will make it easier to land headshots. You get it. These awful zombie enemies attack like three times per turn and they infect you like 99% of the time and they can even attack without a head and they get one more turn after you kill them. Fucking who the hell thought of this? awful so when there's four of you in the squad you and your homies can take care of its putrid nails and head right away so it can't bite or scratch you therefore minimizing the risk of infection it's over. Is the scum? but nothing in this game you just get for free it's never like ayo take this cool little upgrade to be a little stronger so you feel that sense of pride and accomplishment <laughs> no strings attached feeding four mouths with dirt and dried mushrooms is a nightmare at times so it's always a balancing act between do you want to have a stronger squad but be starving half the playthrough or settle for something in between managing your squad's fear and hunger Hey, hey, he said it, yup, that just happened, is a central mechanic of the game, and I know it is, but I've just always, plain and simple, hated this in any game I ever encountered it in. Just knowing that there's always some fucking slider ticking down and that I have to ration supplies like I'm playing the Great Depression Simulator is always somewhere in the back of my mind, not allowing me to take my time exploring and relax. Although to his credit, I highly doubt the dev was going for relaxing when he made this game. This is made even worse by the fact that looting is another truly unfair mechanic based purely on RNG, so you can never be sure how much food you're gonna find. Squad strength is not just about how many mouths you can feed though, cause not every member is created equal. Let me talk about the characters a little, cause their diversity and the way in which you acquire them as teammates kinda illustrates what a quirky and unpredictable game this is. Oh, also. I've been spoiling the game for like 15 minutes already, so spoiler alert. Drop a like to thank me and thank me in the comments and thank me by buying my merch and thank me by checking out the sponsor and following me on Twitter and supporting me on Patreon and most importantly by watching my shit when I upload once every 10 years. You can pick between four characters initially but they're all recruitable in the game as companions. There's also like 10 more playable characters. Some of them aren't really characters, they're just mindless ghouls or demon baby, but others are actual people with their own stories. Likely the first companion you'll come across is a little girl locked in a cage. She's about as useful as you'd imagine a traumatized child to be. You kinda just feel a moral obligation to get her out of the dungeons of eternal pain and suffering, which is why I'm still dragging her around with me. You do have a couple opportunities to trade her for some items or sacrifice her to have your limbs restored, but aside from the fact that who the fuck just hands over a terrifying little girl to some shady prick for a cool sword. I also suspect she's important to the story somehow. Even though she can't deal damage initially, once you find certain weapons small enough for her to wield or teach her some magic, she can become pretty useful for just like an extra headshot attempt. Another companion you can find relatively early is Kahara. He's a thief locked up in the dungeons that joins the squad when you rescue him from the edge of death. You are his miracle saving grace in these dungeons where all sanity has left the chat aeons ago. The one beacon of light granted to him by whatever entity he spent night after night in his jail cell praying to. So to repay you, he 
steals your shit and disappears from the squad. Then when you come across him later on, if you're like, dude, what the fuck? The motherfucker tries to fight you, although you can instead choose to go along with his obvious lie that he got lost, at which point he joins permanently. Enki is a dark priest that you can choose as your starting character. Starting a run as Enki almost felt like playing a different game in the best possible way. This is a good tell of how deep and layered a game is when just approaching it differently uncovers brand new ways to play it. Physical attacks have differing odds of hitting different body parts, most importantly the head is easy easy to miss. Spells, however, have the same accuracy on any body part, so headshots are a lot more viable. Also, magic and cursed weapons are the only things that work on specter type enemies. You can teach magic to any member of the squad if you find the right books, but Enki has an advantage in this area while also having a disadvantage in physical strength. So for example, he can't use double-handed weapons, but he can talk to a cockroach. It delivers a layered, emotionally shattering story. He starts off with a counter magic spell, and if you choose to stab your sister in the neck in the intro, as you do, you'll also be starting with the necromancy spell. This makes the annoying zombie enemies I was trying to avoid earlier a fucking walk in the park, dude. The counter spell immediately neutralizes the magic that's keeping the ghoul's stinky body alive, and the necromancy spell allows you to take control of that pasty bundle of flesh to use as a free disposable party member. And no, you're not allowed to get horny for the zombie's party member portrait. Then there's Griffith. I mean, Lagarde, the main guy you came to the dungeons to rescue. He'll only join your squad if you find him within the first 30 minutes of a run because otherwise he won't be alive enough. It only took me like 30 hours the first time around, so with a little practice, I'll get to him next time. I don't know how a human being can be special enough to warrant a descent into hell. I just know if we're close and you ever get lost in these dungeons, Ooh, buddy, I'm I'm sorry, but I'm just, you know, I'm just so busy that day. And the characters know this too. They realized the dude wasn't worth it like halfway into this shit, but they were in too deep at that point. I know this because there's this chair of contemplation in a certain location, and it's probably just comfortable enough to remind them how life felt on the outside. <laughs> Moonless is the cutest little sleep paralysis demon you've ever seen. She comes across as a regular enemy at first, but because you're watching this video, you'll know that you can choose the talk option, offer her two rotten meats in a row, and she'll join your squad because she's just an overgrown puppy with a few extra teeth. You also can't use rotten meat on any other member without getting poisoned, so she's kind of a free addition to the squad for as long as you can find rotten meat to keep her fed. Here's a Fun one. If you try to inspect the walls of this fleshy hallway, your character, starting to question your judgment by now, will let you know that that might be a bad idea. You love bad ideas, so you do it anyway, and of course you're in a fight against an unbeatable floating head. The only way you can survive this is if you run from the fight. You will never be able to engage with this enemy afterwards. So what's the point then? Well, in a later area, you come across these yellow mages. There's two of them total, and if you try to run past them, they cast spells which straight up blow your limbs off one by one. I shat my pants the first time this happened. These enemies seem super scary and can easily set you back a couple hours. But then I watched the video that you're watching now and found out the trick is to run straight into them to engage combat within the first few seconds before you get your wig pushed back. This way, they're actually pretty easy to beat. So easy, in fact, that Moonless, who you have no control over by the way, she just bites random body parts can easily take them out with a bite to the head. But before the fight, there's a little pop-up where you can choose between calming Moonless down or letting her rip the mage apart, which kinda gets you thinking, why do you even get that option on this enemy specifically, unless you're meant to keep them alive for some reason? Well look at you little smarty pants, you are so smart! If you talk to these guys and choose the right dialogue options, you'll find out they're followers of nah. 
Nazra, the floating head wizard, and you can be given an item that you can present to him. To even think about accomplishing this, you have to target all four of their limbs first because they can cast powerful attacks with each one while you try to use words like a complete beta male. Moonless will always fuck this up, so you get the option of taking her out of the combat. Once you have this item and obtain the cube of depths from a different location, you can go back and actually become homies with the wizard dude. Thing is, his definition of homies is a lot different than yours. He does not give a shit about deceiving, threatening, and straight up killing you. He will randomly attack you and your teammates during combat, and there's a few instances in which he actually kills you. Fun one, like I said. So yeah, I think you probably get the vibe of this game by now, and you are probably not going to play it yourself. At least those were my thoughts when I watched the video about it, but then something kept nagging me in the back of my head. I remembered Oh right, 95,000 subbies or something? I completely forgot. I can definitely, this is definitely a game that I can turn into content. I just think it's a unique game that's worth at least knowing about. And I had fun playing it, even though I hated every moment. Thank you so much for watching. Please go to my website, chromerat.com. Just check it out. No obligations, you don't have to buy anything, just... Take a look at my merch, tell me what you think in the comments. I spent a lot of time on it, I love designing shit. The only manufacturer that had the blanks that I like though is in the US, so if you're in Europe, shipping will be kind of fucked, so I'm sorry for that. I just couldn't sell you like skin tight hoodies. Feels so good to be finally uploading something. I know I say that every time and then I don't upload for six months, but I really, really do enjoy doing this. Thank you to my patrons for still being my patrons. I owe you like a, a proper wet kiss on the teeth when I see you. Can you guess the reason why I haven't uploaded in months now? I got long COVID. This feels like a joke at this point. The universe really doesn't want me to be consistent on YouTube for some reason. But remember, I am never permanently gone. I will keep doing this for as long as I can because it is the only thing in life I enjoy doing.